Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexis Papahelas. Uh, welcome to the Athens uh, Democracy Forum. I'm very privileged uh, today to, have, uh, to moderate a great panel, which will be about democracy and technology. We have with us here uh, Yuval Harari, a great global thinker. Thank you, Yuval, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It took me. us a while to convince you to come to Athens, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Uh, we have Brad Smith, uh, who is a global influencer, I suppose, and you know, a great business leader, president of uh, Microsoft. Thank you for being with us. It's great to be here. And we also have a practitioner uh, who fights uh, the fight of democracy on the front lines, Kirsten Davis, who is the founder of uh, Seng C, and also has been with the New York Times for, for a long time. Um, I want to ask you first of all, I will start with you, Yuval, and is democracy under... Um, under threat at this moment? Well, I guess it's always under threat because, you know, whereas dictatorships are like weeds, they can grow almost everywhere. They don't need a lot of conditions to, 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 to survive. Democracy is like a rare flower that demands a lot of preconditions in order to, to succeed. And it's only very recently in human history that humans even managed to create large-scale democracies. I mean, for most of history, at least after the agricultural revolution, democracies managed to exist only in small places, like city-states, like ancient Athens. Um, so I would say that at any time, we should be careful to preserve democracy. But do you think at this point, with technology advancing rapidly, with social media and everything else, is democracy at an exceptionally uh, risky period of history? Uh, in a way, yes, because we are facing a completely new threat that we have never known before. In brief, technology now enables the creation of completely new totalitarian regimes, digital dictatorships. For the first time in history, it's possible to monitor all the people all the time. It wasn't possible in the Soviet Union, it wasn't possible in Nazi Germany, it is becoming possible now. And secondly, for the first time in history, it's becoming possible for an outside system to know me better than I know myself. And that is a threat to human freedom which never existed before. Stalin could never really know me better than I know myself. But now it's possible. Okay, we'll get back into this because this is a very important part of the conversation, I think. But I want to ask you about democracy again. And, you know, Brad, one thing I, we've been observing, uh, I've been observing, is that, you know, anywhere from Peoria, Illinois, to a village in northern Greece, you see conspiracy theories, you see people losing trust in the pillars of authority, media, government, and everything else. Do you think that you, as a, you know, a leader of a tech company, have some responsibility, some blame to share for this? I think we have a huge responsibility because we have a significant role to play. Uh, I think that you know, technology is agnostic in a sense that it will be used for good or ill depending on the people who put it into application. It'll either be used as a tool or as a weapon. Uh, and you know, in, in the world today, I think we have to put it first in the, the current day context. I very much agree that you know, democracy is always a fragile thing. Um, but I think it is in a more precarious state today than it has been, you know, perhaps since the 1930s. I think technology is one of the significant reasons. Perhaps George Orwell made only one mistake when he wrote his famous book seven decades ago. He perhaps should have entitled his book 2024 instead of 1984. He just saw all of this coming as it turned out four decades earlier than it has. And I think it puts it very well to say that, you know, with technology today, it is indeed possible to apply the kind of mass surveillance that he envisioned and in ways that he couldn't have imagined, as you put it. It becomes possible for someone else to know you perhaps better than you know yourself. That's a very dangerous proposition. Okay. Kirsten? I think that it's, it's definitely a threat. And I think actually one of the risks is that we keep, we, we have a tendency to look back and to look to the uh, maybe older bastions of democracy. We've heard a lot about the US and the UK over the last couple of uh, days and also the institutions that were founded some 75 years ago. 
Um, it says up here reimagining democracy, and there are in fact a number of nations out there that are reimagining and, and recreating democracy. I have the pleasure and the, and the luck to be able to spend a lot of time in Estonia, where they have actually recreated their government and their public services using technology to actually create a, a, a more empowered citizenship. And I think one of the reasons for that is that they are actually uh, probably closer to the threat, both in terms of proximity and, and what they've uh, experienced over the last 20 years. And so uh, it is that threat. The risk is, is that I think we're maybe not looking up and wide enough and further enough, um, far enough. It's some of the solutions, some of the ideas and some of practices that are actually already out there in the world. And I, I think it would, it would help us to maybe reimagine and recreate if we could follow some of those leads and examples. But Brad, let me ask you, I mean, there's been an effort to self-regulate the tech industry and the platforms in terms of content, for example, hate content and so on. Is that enough or should we move to the next phase, which is regulation? Well, I don't think in the history of business there has ever been an industry that has successfully regulated itself entirely. You know, we live in a world where, for good reason, we look to companies to exercise responsibility and we look for governments to apply laws that ensure that even those who are not thinking broadly are, frankly, required to hit some kind of minimum standard. I do think that we're at a point where we need more laws, we need more regulation, but I also think it's important that that not give anybody a pass because it can become easy as well for companies to say, look, this is too hard, we're just going to wait for governments to regulate us, and until they do, we'll just keep doing whatever anybody wants us to do. We'll never live in a world where every government is going to have, I think, a, a, a complete regulatory model that we would say conforms with human rights standards around the world. So we need both. We need high standards by companies, and we need governments to move faster and start to catch up. Yuval, do you think the tech industry is doing enough in terms of protecting us uh, against this information and so on? I think nobody is doing enough. Again, I would say that uh, the main responsibility is of the governments, not of the companies. Yes, I expect the companies to do more, but ultimately, this is the responsibility of governments. And in some places, they are not doing enough because they like it, the situation is that it is developing. In other places, they are just uh, maybe not noticing the danger signs. And, but ultimately, it's, it's the business of the government. You know, sometimes I have the sense that uh, you, you've talked a lot in your books about uh, a class of people which feels useless, right, as mm -hmm. technology progresses and so on. Is it somehow the revenge of these people who feel useless to believe in the conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. to mistrust the system, the authorities and so on? You know, conspiracy theories were always around. It's not a new thing. I mean, the situation now is actually better than in most of history. You look at the conspiracy theory at the time of the Black Death, much worse. You know, the Jews are poisoning the wells, let's go and, and kill all the Jews. This is what was happening in the 14th century. Uh, whenever a new technology of communication comes up, there is just a new method to spread the conspiracy theories. When, when you had the print revolution in Europe in the 15th and 16th century, the big bestsellers were not Copernicus and Galileo Galilei. There were books like uh, do-it-yourself witch hunting. One of the biggest bestsellers was Maleus Maleficarum, The Hammer of the Witches, which was, was a do-it-yourself guide to hide how to identify witches and kill them. That was the big bestseller. And if you look at the 20th century, so you know, something like Nazism, we call it an ideology, but it's actually a conspiracy theory that managed to take over a country and start the worst war in history. It was a conspiracy about, you know, the, the Jews controlling everything from behind the scene and, 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 and so forth. So we should have a perspective on, on what's happening now. And the reason that conspiracy theories are so appealing throughout history is mainly that they are simple and flattering. The problem with the truth, usually, is that the truth is complicated and it's painful. A politician which will tell, let's say in the US elections, which will tell the American public the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the USA and its history has a 100% guarantee of losing the elections. 
And it's the same in Israel, it's the same in India, in Italy. Nobody wants really to know the truth about themselves. And also it's just complicated, you know, to understand how a virus works. Forget about the pandemic. Just understanding what a virus is. It's just, it's not even a living organism. It's a piece of code that manages to take over your body. How does it work? So complicated. Much, more, much easier to believe that there are a bunch of billionaires who created this epidemic in a lab to take over the world. But let me all ask you a question which has really intrigued me for a while. You know, I mean, we usually listen to the people around our own bubble, right? And we look down at people who, you know, love conspiracy theories or they go into this, like, really, you know, uh, off-the-top kind of, you know, sites to look for answers. The question for me is, how do you reach out to these people? They don't read the New York Times or Kathy Merini. Uh, they rarely watch network news or something like this. How do you really sensitize them? You know, how do you tell them, you know, this is crap? Any ideas? Kirsten, yes. Well, I, th I think it's an important question. We've heard a lot about this, especially actually from some of the, the younger panelists we've had over the course of the last couple of days. Um, I work with an organization in Estonia called Sentinel.ai, and we work uh, to de detect deep fakes, to protect media and democracy. We're doing that with, uh, with the government and many corporates, but what we're do trying to do now is also see how we can uh, get an out there and educate the public on this. And I think it's very much about putting yourself into their shoes and having the mindset and saying, what does this mean for me? as a person. Um, how is this going to impact me? How can I uh, make myself aware of it? How can I react and how should I react? What can I do? And I actually see that many of the uh, sort of youth organizations out there and citizen organizations are coming at some of these dem democratic uh, challenges with this mindset. And I think that's a much healthier mindset than the top-down approach that we see from some institutions or, or some governments, um, maybe where they're just working with the, the larger tech organizations. So I think there does to be, need to be empowerment of the people. And, and we're seeking partnerships with academics, with education, and with citizenship organizations to help us do that when it comes to the deep fake issue. Right. Well, I, I would put it in the context of the fact that just here we are in Athens, you know, Athenian democracy was based on this notion of having a conversation with the entire community because the entire community literally was engaged in the democratic process itself. Uh, if you fast forward you know, 2,300 years and go to the early United States, it was a democratic model that at first was, you know, frankly based on having very strict standards about who even got to vote and participate. And over the course of two and a half centuries, that became broader and broader to the point where obviously every, voting is available to everyone who is of a certain age. And then you inject technology. Technology has played this ongoing role for leaders to communicate more broadly with the people they represent. And if you look at people who have succeeded over the course of American history, what you see is that Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860 in part because of the power of the telegraph and the ability to use that to inject it in this new idea of ending slavery you know, into the American conversation. Franklin Roosevelt basically prepared the United States for war and managed the country through the Greatest Depression by using radio in a way that no one had ever had before, by bringing himself literally into people's living rooms through the power of radio. John F. Kennedy and then Ronald Reagan really both really mastered television. And I think one of the things that frankly Donald Trump did very well in 2016 was use social media. And what it really calls on us to do, I think, is think about two things. First, it's back to your point, you better get great leadership out of government itself because there is no substitute for it anywhere else. That means you need great leaders that can use the medium of the time to connect with people broadly and not just narrowly. But second, we need to think about the technology and, and the way it's organized and the way it's being managed. And I think, in my own opinion, one of the biggest challenges right now is that it has turned us back into a community of different bubbles mm -hmm. that are isolated from each other. These other technologies kept broadening the reach 
we may have vigorously disagreed about the events of the day, but at least we were talking about the same events. And so we do have to return to, I think, sort of an understanding of how to ensure that technology fosters a more singular conversation and not a, a, a series of silos. Now, one question is, can machine learning help uh, counter you know, the, the, the damage that has been done? Because we know what algorithms did you know, for a while. Could you embed in your platforms uh, you know, some uh, methods that will detect deep fakes, disinformation, and so on? There are, there are so many ways that technology can help. You know, let's just take deep fakes as just one example to start with. You know, certainly, yes, in the first instance, uh, you know, something like machine learning can and is increasingly being used to detect deep fakes. Reliance on that alone will always be imperfect because it becomes yet another cat and mouse game. Mm -hmm. But in the same way that we've created a system to sort of combat counterfeit money, where you create certain standards, you know, we're already at work to create you know, what is you know, a, a more secure media provenance system so that you know, when the New York Times publishes some content, a video and the like, it becomes much more difficult to tamper with it. So it's a systemic technological approach that we need. And I think what it really requires us to do is start to you know, break these problems apart, take deep fakes as one problem, how do we go solve it, and then think about the other problems we need to go solve as well. And even within deep fakes, there's those that are actually um, creating the deep fakes those that are distributing the deepfakes, and those that are the target of the deepfakes. And we have to tackle all of them. I think it was the UNESCO and ITU report that put up some sort of 11 different ways to actually look at some of these things. We can't just handle one part of it. We have to handle the problem holistically. Yeah, exactly. You well, you have a question for Brad, or this? Um, do you have, as part of your recruiting and training system, an, an ethics course? for engineers, for programmers? I mean, do you think that, you know, like a doctor cannot start practicing right. without going through a process of some, some kind of ethical education? Mm -hmm. And today, I would say that computer engineers are the most important people shaping the world. They are, every time that they think they write code, but they actually write human lives, they, they shape society, they need to understand the ethical and political implications of what they do. So do you have an inbuilt ethical course? And if not, do you plan on, on doing something like that? We have been developing such an ethical code for, say, Microsoft around artificial intelligence. I would first say, I think the question that you've just posed is such a critical one. To me, it is deeply ironic that, for example, in the United States today, you cannot graduate from one of the military academies without taking a course in ethics. But you can get a computer science degree from most of the top 10 computer science universities in the United States or the world without ever taking a course in the ethics of, say, something for artificial intelligence or computing more broadly. Mm -hmm. I do think there's cause for optimism in this space, especially just the, the way momentum has accelerated over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we defined in 2018 six ethical principles for AI, and it just in summary form, you know, it's around you know, uh, fairness or avoidance of bias, protection of privacy, safety and security, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. And we've been building a whole system of training engineers and identifying engineering practices. Uh, and if you look at the trends around the world, the most encouraging thing to me is that you see this convergence around a set of ethical principles. I think what we're learning is that's just step one. You know, it, it sort of tells us the answers to the first round of questions. There is so much more learning ahead of us that then gets then put into training. I don't think by 2030 you'll be able to graduate and get a computer science degree without taking the kind of course that you've just mentioned. It, you know, people have now, and especially this next generation has now realized that they want to do things that are going to serve the world and not just create this agnostic code. Well, we don't have, we can't wait 10 years. I mean, at least Microsoft can just take a decision tomorrow morning, or like you can leave this panel, yeah. mm -hmm. pick up the phone, <laughs> and okay, 
from, from tomorrow, nobody is accepted to Microsoft unless they have, I don't know, so and so many points in ethics course. Um, what I can say is the easiest thing for us to do is to say, you won't be at Microsoft for more than six months without taking a course that we give you ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're going first. And then we're encouraging the universities to get on board. Which uh, books would you have a computer engineer read? Oh, so many different ones. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy O'Neill, Weapons of Math Destruction, mm -hmm. if, if you know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and by Shoshana Zuboff, I think, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Zuboff from, from Harvard. Yeah, I mean, like, they are the first two that came to my mind, but there are so many others. Any classics? You would Any have classics? Oof. <laughs> uh, you know, we are in Athens, so it's good to read Plato, Aristotle, philosophy. I mean, really, I would say that the interesting thing of what's happening right now is that the questions that for thousands of years belonged to the philosophy department are now migrating to the computer science department. Mm -hmm. You know, philosophers are very, very patient people. They can argue about free will for 2,000 years, reach no decision, and that's fine. But engineers who have to put a self-driving car on the road tomorrow or in two years, they can't wait. They can't wait for the philosophers. So, I would say it's more than just having a few principles of uh, ethics for AI. It's really learning how to think philosophically and ethically about different problems. Like, you know, you, you even design a tool for banks, an algorithm to decide who to give a loan to and who not to give a loan to. This shapes human lives. And you need, to under, you need ethics for that because so many biases can be inadvertently built into your algorithm. And the thing is that algorithms think in a different way than humans. They make decisions in a different way. One of the big problems with this algorithmic revolution is that more and more decisions will be taken in a way that humans simply can't understand. If the bank refuses to give you a loan and you ask why, the bank just says, we don't know. The algorithm said no. We can show you all the data the algorithm went over, but you know it's millions of pages. You can't do nothing with it. So the, the place to intervene is when you design the algorithm. And for that, you need really not just a few principles. You need a, a, a structure of thinking which comes from the world of philosophy and ethics and not just from the world of engineering. But do you actually have faith that the industry will do this and bring it upon itself, or you think government needs to step in? Again, ultimately, I believe this is the job of government. You know, the, the same way that uh, you can regulate that doctors need to take certain courses before they can start practicing, you can legislate it also for computer scientists. It would be good if the industry will do it tomorrow, because governments will take longer. But ultimately, uh, yes, I hope to see government action on, on, that, on that level. Are you optimistic about self-regulation? Um, well, we've been hearing people call for it. The, the, the major tech organizations are calling for it. The government uh, you know, are calling for regulation because self-regulation, just as Brad said, you know, it would be lovely to think that it would work, but let's be honest. Um, one of the questions, if I may for a second just take off my professional hat and put my citizen hat on, is say that we've been talking about this for a very long time. Um, there is a, a need to build on what the League of Nations tried to do, uh, to create a digital Geneva Convention, to build on the Tallinn Manual. Um, this is clear, the need is there. Um, you started talking about the digital Geneva Convention in 2017, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, and, and we, we clearly hear the need. So as a citizen, I ask, what is needed to make it happen? What do we actually need to do? We're clear that it's needed, but with my citizen hat on, as a citizen, what can I do to actually have influence, impact, give empowerment to you yourself, Brad, or whoever else is needed out there, the great thinkers, mm -hmm. you know, the great talkers, and, and uh, how do we get from think, talk, to do, and actually make this happen? Well, I think there's two different concepts we're talking about here, and it's worth thinking about how they come together, because at, at one level, I, first of all, I agree, you know, we need new international norms. 
We need the world's democracies to step forward. We need governments to recognize that they are the first and last line of not just defense, but I think responsibility in addressing these issues. And I do think that citizens actually have a voice. Uh, one of the things that we've sought to do is think about you know, diplomacy in the 21st century and you know, the role for really citizen activism uh, in people using their voice. So you know, we've been one of the companies that's actually been very supportive of civil society efforts you know, to, to use this technology to enable people to ensure their voices are heard. I also think this does connect back with this other point. Um, yeah, I share your sense that you, know, you don't think that you can come up with a set of principles and feel like you're done. Um, I think if you create a set of principles, you can think that you've begun, you know, you've started to identify the questions and some potential answers. To me, part of what we're talking about here is the need to recognize that technology development is now really a multidisciplinary exercise. You know, from, say, the 1970s to, uh, I'll say, the 2010s, you know, if you look at tech companies, you know, it, it was really the, the, this great sort of castle filled with computer scientists and then data scientists. And, you know, in the world today, I, we urgently need to educate the people who are creating technology in a much broader approach. I think philosophy is a piece of it. I actually think myself that history is a great piece of this. I mean, you read your books and you're reading history uh, because you know, history is the proving ground for these different ideas. It's where you learn what worked and what failed. And I've always found that you know, there are lessons in what happened with society's attempt to regulate railroads that speak clearly to what we need to do to regulate you know, information technology today. Um, you know, so I, I do believe a lot of this starts in universities. Uh, looking to you know, the people in the engineering schools and the computer science departments to be getting a stronger dose from others of the liberal arts. I think we're at a moment in time where people who you know, major in the liberal arts really need a course in computer science and statistics <laughs> and the like. And we're going to need to help the rest of us catch up you know, with what we didn't study when we were university students, for example, and bring that into businesses and into government. And, and I think actually throughout our entire lifespans, education is still perceived as something that goes on whilst you're at school and university. Um, but because tech is changing so fast and we're using it throughout our lives, I think education now needs to be a lifelong process. We know that it's the 65-year-olds who share the fake news and the conspiracy theories more often on social mm. media, in fact, seven times more often <laughs> than the rest of the population. And so I think it, the, the education around technology needs to now become a lifelong learning process and not just in the, in the schools and universities. Can I ask you if there's progress, if you can be candid about this, within Microsoft? Was there a time when the, the financial or the tech guys that would look at you and say, you know, what are you talking about? Why should we bother about social justice or all these issues? Oh, I think the uh, climate today is vastly different from, say, you know, the climate 27 years ago when I started at Microsoft. Um, you know, we always were fortunate as a company to have somebody like Bill Gates, who was a very broad-minded thinker. But, you know, Bill's been among those to say, gee, he thought in the early 90s that the best thing, you know, he could do to Washington, D.C. was ignore it. You know, and, and you know, that, that, that has changed. Now, in part, that's changed across the industry out of almost purely pragmatic conclusions. Well, boy, if you ignore governments, they'll end up doing things to you that you don't like. To me, what we have today increasingly, certainly at Microsoft, I feel it, is a broader-minded and more enlightened approach. You know, what fundamentally we rely on is not just attracting but retaining people who care deeply about doing something good for the world. And they look to us as the company's leaders, sometimes frankly perhaps even with unrealistic expectations about what we can do to solve the world's problems. But that is a very powerful motivator. Our mission today is, you know, it's really grounded in empowering people and organizations around the world to, to achieve more in what they're doing. So, you know, the, the, the debates that we have on an ongoing basis are very much the debates that I think you would hope to see inside a company. You know, 
What is it going to mean for human rights if we provide facial recognition for this purpose or not? What is it going to mean if we build a data center in this country and sub potentially subject data to being seized by that government? And, you know, as we say, we strive to be principled, but we're only principled if we actually apply the things that we've called principles and, and, and be prepared to turn down business opportunity when they conflict. You've, you've talked about the COVID crisis mm -hmm. as a watershed moment uh, in terms of uh, surveillance, data surveillance and mm -hmm. so on. Explain to us your fears, your, your concerns about this and how we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. well, I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if, this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed all, all the time, not just in authoritarian machines, but even in democracies. And maybe most importantly at all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. Because really we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans, to understand deeply what's happening within you, what, what, makes, you, what, what, what makes you go. And for that, the most important data is not what you read and who you meet and what you buy, it's what's happening inside your body. So we had these two big revolutions, the computer science revolution or the, the infotech revolution, and the revolution in the biological sciences. And they are still separate, but they are about to merge. They are merging around, I would say, the biometric sensor. It's the thing, it's the gadget, it's the technology that converts biological data into digital data that can be analyzed by computers. And having the ability to really monitor people under the skin, this is the, the biggest game changer of all. Uh, because this is the key for getting to know people better than they know themselves. I often give the example from my own personal life that I realized I was gay only when I was 21. And I keep thinking about the time when I was 15, 16, how could I have missed it? You know, so something so important about myself should have been obvious, but I didn't know. Now, today or in five or 10 years, any algorithm uh, of Microsoft or Amazon or the government would be able to know such a thing when I'm 12 or 13 just by monitoring what's happening in my body, what's happening to my eyes when I, let's say I see a boy and a girl walking on the beach. Where do my eyes focus? So this is the crucial revolution and COVID is critical because this is what convinces people to accept, to legitimize total biometric surveillance. If we want to stop this epidemic, we need not just to monitor people, we need to monitor what's happening under their skin, their body temperature. Like we, we walked in here, we had to go through a, a body temperature test. Even in Israel, it has become a national security yeah. issue, right? The so again, I'm not against surveillance. It's an important tool, especially to fight epidemics. The question is again, who is doing it and how? If you give it to the security service to do it, that's extremely dangerous. Yes, now they are using it to see whether you have the coronavirus. But exactly the same technology can determine what you think about the government. You know, anger is a biological phenomena just like disease. It's not some spiritual thing out there. It's a biological pattern in your body. With this kind of surveillance, I mean, you watch the big president, the big leader, gives a speech on television. The television could be monitoring you and knowing whether you're angry or not, just by analyzing the cues, the biological cues coming from your body. So you now people are now watching us online, all over the world, this, this conversation. Now, maybe even right now, the people who are watching us are being watched and analyzed. And you know, the thing is, it's not just you're now watching this. The thing is, we know that you're watching this and we also know how you feel. Are you angry about what you hear? Are you frightened? Are you bored? 
This is the kind of power that Stalin didn't have. You know, when Stalin gave a speech, everybody, of course, clapped their hand and smiled. Now, how do you know what they really think about Stalin? It's very difficult. You can't have a KGB agent following everybody all the time. Even if, even if you do it, he's just watching your outside behavior. He doesn't really know what's happening in your mind. But in 10 years, the future Stalins of the 21st century, they could be watching the minds, the brains of all the population all the time. And also, they will have the computing power to analyze all that. You know, it's not just having an agent following everybody all the time. The agent in Stalin's days writes a paper report, and it, you have these millions of paper reports piling up in Moscow. Somebody needs to read them, to analyze them. That's impossible. Now you don't need human agents. You don't need human analyzers. You just have a lot of sensors and an AI which analyzes it, and that's it. You have the worst totalitarian regime in history. And COVID is important because COVID legitimizes some of the crucial steps, even in democratic countries. I actually, well, so your question is, has COVID been a, a, a watershed for data surveillance? I actually think of it as being a temperature check for trust. Um, because as you said, when we come in, we have to do a temperature check, okay? And that's actually kind of what's happened with the tracing apps that many of the governments have, had, have tried to put into place to monitor and to control. We have not seen great uptake in these applications um, because people, thanks to uh, you know, sort of Cambridge Analytica, the social dilemma, are now aware of the value of their data and how it could be used against them potentially. So even when their lives are at stake now, they're not prepared. They do not trust their governments enough, even with their life and their health in order to give their data by signing up for these um, contact tracing apps. So I think I would describe COVID as being a temperature check for trust of governments in, uh, around data and data surveillance. Okay. But if I want to ask you, how far has technology progressed? I mean, you have the insider's view of this. Well, I think technology has progressed quite a ways, and I think these factors really come together. And I think it's right to think about this as uh, you know, a moment of, in time of, of you know, substantial historical significance. First of all, I think that the focus on biometrics is, is the right one. And I think that's why the debate on facial recognition is so important. Mm -hmm. Facial recognition is the first form of what is fundamentally you know, biometric identification. Um, you know, that has not only been widely deployed, it's one that people actually use every day often to unlock their own phone but it's spread so broadly that now it has emerged as part of the public debate. And you know, as governments steer a course on facial recognition, you know, what they're really doing, I think, is creating a model that they may end up emulating for all forms of biometrics. So it's really important to get that right. And frankly, I think it's really important to go beyond a relatively almost simple debate, do we allow it or ban it, to wait a second, how do we regulate it? What uses do we permit? What uses do we ban? I think the, the COVID crisis is fascinating for both of the reasons that you all are describing. First of all, it is absolutely being used in some countries, especially by authoritarian regimes, to put more controls in place. And in many ways, even in the world's democracies, the privacy issues around COVID-19 are not really getting the full debates that I think they deserve. You know, it's one of the reasons that we, as early as May, you know, came out with a set of requirements for our involvement in, say, tracing apps. And we said, look, if all of this additional information is going to be uh, available and needed in this time of crisis, first, it should be used only for this sp specific purpose and no other. Second, it shouldn't be retained after the crisis passes. Third, we should look for ways to minimize the privacy impact. It's one of the reasons that I've been very uh, you know, enthusiastic about technology that keeps somebody's information on their own device rather than putting it where it can be accessed by someone else. And then it's only shared in an anonymous way if somebody actually is notified that they've, for example, tested positive. Because what we're fundamentally finding is exactly what you described. The world created this technology that arguably will help keep everyone safer. 
and in most parts of the world, people are responding by saying, no, thank you. I don't trust this. Now, in some cases, they're saying, I don't trust it, and I don't really have confidence that it's going to make that much of a difference in my life. So that's all the more reason to say, no, thank you. But the real risk is that governments will mandate its use, and they'll mandate its use without the debate having put in place the kind of fundamental protections for human rights but that Brad, we desperately need. Where is need. government leadership going to come on this? We, we don't see it coming from the U.S. Is Europe going to lead the way, I think, you think on this? I think on most issues of uh, privacy protection, Europe has led the way. I think to some degree Europe led the way because it was the continent that suffered the most from the absence of privacy protection in, say, the 1930s. And then again in you know, East Germany under the Stasi in the three decades that followed. Um, but you know, since the 1980s, Europe has consistently led the way. Now, we now have privacy laws in place in more than 100 countries around the world. We're still waiting for the United States to catch up. And yeah, I desperately think we need more work among the world's democracies to put sort of a, a blueprint together of how to protect privacy, how to protect public health, say, but do it in a way that is really also consistent with these fundamental freedoms. Okay. We have about four minutes left, so I want to go back to the original question, which was, is democracy under threat? And what I want to ask each one of you is to let us know your thoughts about what we should do in order to defend democracy, but in very practical terms, not just broad theoretical terms. Kristen? Okay, um, I actually spend a lot of time doing hackathons. I love participating in them, um, being right there with often a very urgent need. I did one recently, Build for Belarus. Expl explain to us. What they are, how they uh, work uh, for so, the So, yeah, no, this is part of, the, part of the thing. Hackathons, people often think that it's very techy people who know to, how to code and how to hack. And, and this is why I don't actually like the word hackathon. We need to find something different and better because it's about finding solutions, collaborating very quickly, uh, breaking things, trying them again until you actually get to something that, that works to quickly address a problem, as we did um, after the, the Belarusian elections, trying to find solutions, using facial recognition and AI to find people that had been um, taken from the streets. I would love to see a different word for hackathon so that we can have more of society, more citizens playing parts in these because I think it's a, a real way of engaging with the problems that democracy threatens um, and it's also incredibly empowering. And I would love to then see how we can uh, take that and build that into, uh, maybe create a new iteration of Davos or something like that. So we've got the thinkers and the talkers, and through whatever this new hackathon word is, we can inject the doers and the citizens into it to really uh, em I mean, sort of empower citizens a lot more, I think. Actually, the organizers have found through some uh, magical biometric uh, method that the, the audience likes the conversation. We'll, we'll keep it on for another five minutes, I think. Or something. Okay. <laughs> but, Brad, what should we do in order to defend democracy in practical terms? Well, what I would say is two things. I mean, first, we do need tech companies to keep pushing faster on the kinds of tools that will protect democracy. And I, there, you know, there are more steps being taken. I mean, you look at the election of 2020 in the United States, and what you see every week is Google, Facebook, Microsoft, others saying this is what we've disrupted today in terms of attacks from Russia, China, Iran, and elsewhere. And, and that's just one example of where we can and must do more. Um, but I would say at the end of the day, this is ultimately is about governments, and that means in the, the world of democracy around citizens and people. And you know, I do think democracy is under threat. Democracy is going to have to almost prove itself again in the years and decade ahead. And I think if democracy dies, it will die in separate silos. If it flourishes, as I think we clearly all want it to do, it will flourish with countries doing more together. We're talking about a series of global challenges, whether it's a virus that respects no border or carbon that moves in the air from country to country. We need people to vote for leaders who will act in a united way and bring the world's democracies together to address the problems of our time, yeah, but do it with an appreciation for values that were born here in many ways in Athens 25 centuries ago. I want to ask you, I mean, President Trump has made it very clear that he's going to question the election result if he loses. He said this is not going to end well. You have launched the Defending Democracy initiative and so on. 
How sure are you about the, the integrity of the electoral system right now in the U.S.? And will you be able to defend it if things get really ugly there? I think the answer is yes. At the end of the day, there is every reason to have confidence in our voting systems in the United States, whether people vote by mail or whether they vote by person. Um, you know, the other thing we should always remember is democracy actually always works well when it comes to voting as long as the gap between the two candidates is, say, two points or more. And it is always extremely fragile when a race is won by just a hair. You know, whether it's a community election that's won by 100 votes or a state that's won by 10,000, that's when you end up with all of these recounts. And it, that it was true in the year 2000 in Florida between Al Gore and George W. Bush. It was true in many other years as well. But I think that, that is going to look like a walk in the park in comparison to what's going to happen now. Well, let me just say, first, let's see. Everybody's assuming at this point that the worst case will emerge. Oftentimes, when you assume the worst, that's not bad because then you find out that the reality is better than you thought. But at the end of the day, look, we have spent, as I just say, as an American here, you know, as a nation, you know, two and a half centuries strengthening the way people vote, strengthening the way we count the votes. There are many challenges, including the fact that it is harder for some people, including people of certain races, to vote than others. But should we have confidence in the integrity of our voting system? Absolutely. And do we need people who say they will respect the outcome, whether they win or lose? That is the very essence of a democracy. It is the cornerstone of American democracy. And I think we should always go forward with the expectation as the electorate that, of course, everybody who puts their name on the ballot will respect the outcome. If they didn't, they should have never put their name on the ballot to begin with. In terms of external powers influencing the, the result, have, have things, are things different now than 2016? Okay. Well, two things are different now. One is the attacks are more varied and more sophisticated. But second, we actually know what's going on. So people are more educated. Well, and we're all doing more to fight these threats, whether you're talking about the tech sector or the parts of the US government that are responsible for the nation's defense. You always have to worry deeply, in my view, about this as well. You'd never take for granted our ability to withstand these threats because they are quite sophisticated. But you know, you're always the worst prepared when you don't recognize the problem that you face. I think today we do. Ivo, what should we do in order to defend democracy in practical ways? Well, on the individual level, the most important thing is to join an organization. Uh, 50 people belonging to an organization can accomplish far, far more than 500 individuals working on their own. So whichever cause is dearest to your heart, join an organization, you can accomplish far more. If you're an engineer, I would say two practical inventions, developments I would like to see as soon as possible is first of all an antivirus for the mind, the same <laughs> way that we have an antivirus for our computers to defend it against hacking and so forth. We need it now for the human mind. Again, something that works for me, not for Microsoft, not for Google, not for Baidu, but something I can buy and that gets to know me in order to protect myself against being hacked. And secondly, I would like engineers to work on uh, kind of balancing the surveillance equation. Yes, we have more surveillance of citizens. We need more surveillance of the people on top at the same time. So we need to build more tools to, for example, fight government corruption. And, you know, the technology, as you said in the beginning, it's neutral. You tell it to survey, to monitor the citizens, it monitors the citizens. You tell it to monitor the presidents and CEOs and so forth, this is what we'll do. So I would like to see more engineers working on developing tools that monitor the presidents and CEOs and ministers in the service of the citizens. Okay, tomorrow morning you have a conversation with our Prime Minister, mm -hmm. which yeah. is widely anticipated. So what are you going to ask him? I mean, what, what is the main theme of this conversation? 
Ooh, I haven't thought about it yet. I mean, <laughs> I, I like to, to see you know, what the conversation goes. I can give you a few goes. ideas if you want. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. um, I, I would like to see what the conversation... I mean, being, leading a country is far, far more complicated than writing books. <laughs> And the main problem is that people in those positions, they're usually so busy and so... Uh, they are so busy that they don't have time to look at the big picture. So I would like really to understand how the big picture looks from the viewpoint of somebody who is on the front line of actually acting. Okay, great. Kirsten, Brad, uh, you will thank you very much for this conversation. I would love to have the same conversation a year from now. I think things will be very different in many ways. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I thank you all for this lively thank conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you.